All right, ladies and gentlemen, everyone around and in between, it is Debate Sensei. Um, we uh, have a series where we tackle topics that we think are relevant to uh, competitive debate, uh, specifically limited preparation types of competitive debate. Uh, we have Tim Seavey from the prestigious uh, uh, Cal State San Diego. <laughs> I'm like, what? Where were you from again? SDSU. Yeah, SDSU. yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah, not Cal State. What did I say? Oh, man. Well, from uh, California State University. Not, not, yeah. Canyon of the Santiago College. Yes. <laughs> Miller. Yeah, all right. Um, so, so we're uh, ICDA, right? So, literally, yeah, price bait yeah. on these few. Where did so, these topics come from? Uh, these topics, oh, that's right. These came from, okay, well, we are uh, going to be posting this right before the warm up in Torrance, California at El Camino College. So we took these topics from round one at last year's tournament, ah, right? Nice. Yeah. So uh, we, we take a look at them. These are kind of the, what you might expect to see at a college level IPDA tournament, all right? I'm sure that there's regional differences. So Torrance, California, you know, Southern California. I'm, I'm wondering, and now I'm interested in what the regional differences might be in those. All yeah, right. IPDA that I've seen from other parts of the country hasn't seemed like dramatically different. There seems to be like a somewhat consistent convention. But I right. think IPDA as an event seems to be changing faster than many others just because it's still new and kind of finding its footing of like what judges want to see and what's rewarded for, you know, competitive success and what isn't. So I think that shift kind of lends itself to a little bit of, you know, interpretation and, and motion over the years, but it keeps it fun. Uh, so, all right. Uh, shall we flip a coin for who goes first? Or yeah, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna get my my screen up here right now. So the way that this works is that we flip coin. Uh, whoever it ends up on the negative, they get to strike first. Okay. And since I'm flipping, I always let Tim call it. Go for it. Tails. Boom. Tails. So you choose the. Oh wait. Yeah. Go ahead. Choose the side. I didn't. Yeah. Make I think the him. winner of the coin toss chooses the side. So yeah, I yeah. will choose. Negative. No, I take it back. I'm sorry. I choose affirmative. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's let's take a look here. All right. So we have our, our five topics, which will be in the description. Okay. Boom, boom, boom. So I'm the neg. Yep. So you strike okay. first. Okay. This one for sure. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, Metaphors yeah. are tricky, especially references. Okay. So if we did have to debate this, though. On the affirmative, I guess I'm trying to define whether or not this is good, or I guess I can just like pick a topic that is like, here is a circumstance that we're going to pose something that just really should be a thing. Yeah, like, because I, I know how judges work. They just want a debate to happen, right? And so the, it's almost like pick your pet case, the thing that, you know, is so good that nobody can deny how good it is, you know, and, and yeah. now you just run, I'm like, uh, now if I were forced to debate this on the neg though, I think my only way to prepare this is to go hard for the context of this, this line from the Godfather, right? You know, yeah. it's like this one, it, it, like you have to, the offer has to be one of implied violence. Mm. And I say that if you don't do that, then you are not, you know, you're, you're, you're just not topical. Um, and like, you know, it, that should be part of your burden of proof on the affirmative. The, my only predictable ground is knowing the context that this line came from, you know, like one of the most popular movies of all time, one of the most popular lines from the most popular movie of all times, I think that we should at least give me that level of predictability. So I feel like then it comes down to like an inherency sort of challenge that I'm placed on the, on the affirmative there where it's like, I've got to pick something that has like this overwhelming support and backing of potential violence, but also that's still inherent. Like if I'm going to fiat something be a thing. Um, yeah. So I guess what I would probably pick is like, something that everyone supports that they'd be really pissed if it didn't happen, but that isn't currently happening. So 
my pocket case would be congressional term limits. Like, yeah. <laughs> like 70 plus percent of people across both sides of the aisle always support, like the only change over and who doesn't support term limits is like whoever's political party would lose out that cycle. But literally you, you switch over to the next, uh, you know, the other side of the aisle has control of Congress and it still stays 70. It just happens to be more of the other side. So the people really, really, really want it. I guess I would probably say like, hey, an election went a particular way and people rioted. That was pretty awful. So there's your threat of violence. Uh, this yeah. is something that people support even more than Donald Trump was supported. And so I don't know, like, <laughs> it got uh, you know, okay, backing. Okay, so, it's not a great backing, but I'm like, there's the okay. violence, I suppose, to merit. There was one round I was coaching my students and they were they were struggling, right? They were they were down already like three rounds they knew they weren't going to break and it came up to like i think supreme court term limits or something along mm -hmm. they came up with term limits right i'm like let's have fun with this because i wanted to kind of break them out of their their rut their you know the, the yeah. this sort of pattern that they're falling into and i want to not take it too seriously and so um the plan was to demand term limits and threaten assassination if they don't abide <laughs> So I actually like so your your case could be topical if you use an actual strategy that I coached in a round and they won. <laughs> they won that one because <laughs> like that. Oh, I vote for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Also, like who's taking the side of literally any congressional candidate? Like yeah. you've got the <laughs> Joker. You've got, you know, 435 Jokers. And you are like, yeah, absolutely. Like, get them. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. So I think that would be uh, that would be kind of a fun one. Um, it's like anytime you get to fight against the enemy that everyone can point to is like, yeah, they're kind of the bad guy. Like yeah. there's, you know, a couple here and there that people may cling to is like, no, but this one's good. But for like by and large, Congress never has a good approval rating. And you could say like, yep, if you don't get out of office, it's treason. Like you all have, have clung to power way too long and ignored uh, the people's risk, like wishes way too uh, long. Because okay. you're the only ones with your hands on the levers of power, like to actually change it. So okay. yeah, there's your out. You get one okay. six year term. And like, I, I would, I would say like, you know, staying past that is treason, which holds the death penalty. You know what? Like now that I think about it, I think the topicality debate is more fun than the term limits debate. If you, <laughs> yeah, I think I would like sure. to see that debate more than the term limits debate. Sure. But even though like the term limits debate is the thing that induces it, like uh, clearly, you know what I mean? So it's still part of it, but not not on case. You know what I mean? It's like, I think yeah. I'd like to see like, you know, an analysis of the, you know, movie quotes and, and like, what does that mean when we're debating hmm. them? You know, stuff like, so whatever. We, we, we're we spending yeah. a, a lot of time on this metaphor. You're up next. You're, you're Okay, so actually, I didn't think that would, uh, last minute was on. So, all right. So that one was my last revolt. Uh, I would next strike... This is an interesting one that you'd probably like, but I'm going to say this one. Hypocrisy okay. can be justified. I just don't like arguing that on the affirmative because I think the debates that end up boiling down to like, I don't know, like act utilitarianism uh, where it's like, you know, they're like duty ethics of like one has an obligation to always be honest. And then like, well, what about in what circumstances? I find that kind of like philosophy 101 debate to get boring really quickly. And I don't... Uh -huh typically find it very fun. Like I right. think that it, it you kind of quickly easily exhaust the fun topics. Like that one might be better to be had over beers than in a debate round. Okay. Okay. So on the neg, hypocrisy cannot be justified. Hmm. So like honesty is the best policy. You're doing like a sort of deontology um, approach to it you know uh like you can never yeah lying is always wrong is always unethical uh yeah you're right that is like you said philosophy 101 i mean that's like that's, that's like, like just the, the straight up like do you have an obligation to always be honest like i think you end up getting down to like okay well here are circumstances where leaders have lied and it has like worked out in their favor and it saved lives or here are yeah. circumstances where it like actually costs things and i think it just becomes like a, a big pile of historical examples for and against i don't know that you really end up coming out with a clean resolution to it yeah the only way i could see uh, uh taking a different tack than that would be like doing um like language uh critique not not language critiques as in you're using the wrong language mm -hmm. but like, like 
analyzing what language is, how it is used, and exploring why the ambiguity and abstractions of language means that hypocrisy can be justified. So it's like hypocrisy's like connotation over time has changed such that it's not like we're not arguing that lying can be justified. We're arguing hypocrisy and that like has a different cultural meaning. Perhaps. Yeah. I mean, in one sense, it was kind of, I think the end result would be that his hypocrisy becomes kind of like in the eye of the beholder. And huh. uh, <laughs> okay. like, like hypocrisy is an accusation made against somebody. Sure. But people are always acting, in, you know, in their their natural self. And so you can always explain that the, what you heard as a contradiction between uh, what I said and what I did is, is is something you have to deal with, not something that's inherent in what I did. You know what I mean? So, hmm. OK, it, it's still <laughs> philosophical. It kind of slimy quickly, I feel like. Yeah, yeah, it does. It does. Um, and so but I, I'm kind of you know, fascinated with that. It's, it's really, really fundamental, you know? Um, and so it's the best discussion I can come up with, but That's yeah, I, not, not really my, one of my favorite ones. All right. Your turn. Um, let's see here. So we got two international, mm -hmm. one domestic, huh? You know what? I'm going to force an international. No. Yeah, oh, this is the course. best topic. Okay. Yeah, no, not necessarily. <laughs> I, I put it as my number one topic for both, not because it's just like, oh, free college is a good topic. I think like making the federal government, like one, it being the federal government as an actor and two, it being public college, I think makes it more interesting. I think like it, it spurns these things where like, I really like critiquing higher education in general, um, yeah. especially like at a higher education like event, uh, just because I think there are so many holes that are so easily just like brushed over. Like, the fact that everyone in that debate room probably has five figures or more of debt, right? Uh, yeah. Like that's a real thing that everyone is dealing with. And yet we pretend like it's not. And it's like, you know, this trillion dollar burden over an entire generation's head that like we can talk about in rounds, but then we just like go home and sleep at night because like, well, at least it was kicked off this month. Like, thanks old Joe. But like <laughs> it then can actually in many circumstances, like before that was the case, it was like crippling people's lives and have like these major ill impacts like to give someone a liberal arts degree or a degree in philosophy or communication, something stupid, you know? Yeah. So with those degrees, <laughs> like I think that the like the cultural insistence upon a four-year degree from higher education that costs a quarter million dollars is just like asinine. And it's a really, really amazing business practice that universities have figured out. Like they've got not just like, you know, the way that De Beers has made diamonds like a cultural demand, like universities have figured out like now nah, we're going to charge way more and say this is something you have to have. Otherwise, you know, there's all kinds of like fallout of like, oh, what's wrong when you, a high school kid says they're not going to college next? There's like this, you know, cultural shaming to that. Um, and I think that's really messed up and forces all kinds of awful financial you know, circumstances on 18 year olds or younger than 18 year olds, which is is just like I find morally corrupt. So, yeah. but then the federal government having to provide for like, oh, that's going to be really expensive. Like, ah, good. The institution that has too damn much money and spends it on the wrong things should spend too damn much money on the wrong things. Like if we're going <laughs> to, like, this is both sides playing exactly as they should. And if you really have a beef with it, good, take beef with both sides. So that's where I actually find it to be a really fun topic on the affirmative of like, whether you do or don't support Act like a, a higher education, a you know, a, a liberal education, you can still say that like the federal government is the one that should be just blowing money on it. Yeah, yeah. Like one of the reasons why I I always shy away from it from on the the negative side. I feel I, I feel like I get forced into a sort of nitpicky counterplan ground. You know, what I mean, like sure. maybe uh, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, there's good or, cases. Yeah, that's not that's not really competitive. Like the the the, comp the competition tends to come in when I'm doing like interest free loans or, um, you know, like uh, uh, debt forgiveness or or like uh, making m making uh, student loans, um, you know, that you, you can they can be expunged with bankruptcy or something like that, removing that sort of exception from them. Uh, I, you know, those things um, really only have partial solvency. Um, and then you still have to go hard for, you know, how much it costs and, hmm. you know, yeah, you have to like win multiple things and none of them are really 
you know, attractive, you know, not compelling, you know, like just just generally interesting. They just seem like you're struggling the whole time and maybe you could pull it off. Yeah, I think when you can run like three, you know, non-conditional counter plans, like at the same time, she's like, ah, we'll see what sticks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm not, I don't know. I like having really big, solid uh, theses, regardless of what side I'm on. Like one thing that like I am rallying around, I'm not going to give up, I know is competitive um, and is just attractive. You know what I mean? That there's some sort of um, thing that, 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 draws people into it and i'm not getting that right off the top of my head gotcha okay all right that's fair then i shall cement so we got two international topics now and yep. they're okay I, technically I yeah about. like i had to do some quick research to be like ah, i need to be up on this um i'm gonna switch what my original prep was i'm going to eliminate this one Oh, wow. I, I know what's co what the topic is now, but yeah. let's talk okay. about Iran. So Ooh. now is the time to negotiate with Iran. Here's the only reason why I'd strike this topic. Like, I think, you know, uh, any kind of international negotiation becomes fun because it's not like you're, well, it also can, can be a, a dull round. But if you've got two teams that are, like, kind of sharp on it, it can be fun because you end up with, like, there, you're not exercising hard power. It is negotiation as the the plan, right? Like that's the function. But this one, of course, is a little bit weirder because it's about now is the time. So you're just having a time frame. Like you can even agree with it on the affirmative and yeah. be like, or on the negative, you can be like, yep, we totally should reignite or uh, re-engage conversation with Iran, but not right now. Right. Uh, or, oh, actually, no, I'm sorry. Now is not the time. This is a negative. Yeah, so yeah, on the you're the I just have to pick not right now. So I can even like agree with any harms or whatever, but it's just a delay. And yeah. that is a little less fun to me. I wish it were positive and said, you know, we're just like USFG should renegotiate with me or whatever. But um, sometimes delay counter plans are just awesome. Like if yeah. you have some sort of some, some sort of time critical disadvantage um, it's so awesome. It's so awesome because then you can just say, listen, I, I want to avoid this one disadvantage. And then the, 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 the counter plan isn't technically what you're winning on. It's the disadvantage that you're winning on. And so you getting the first crack at that on the affirmative um, that, you, you know, gives you a little strategic advantage. But I understand, you know, like being forced to do a time delay plan right off the bat is yeah. kind of a little weird. It is a little weird. Yeah, it's a funkier position. So in just looking at it, generally, the most recent things that I'm seeing, uh, you know, as far as developments with Iran, is that the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Association, was uh, not able to, like, find anything more. Like, their reports are just getting nowhere with how much progress uh, Iran is making towards weaponizable, uh, enriched uranium. Mm. So they they just aren't getting inspectors in. They're not getting reports. They're not getting intelligence that t shows them one way or another. So I think that's probably actually ground for you to say, like, we're not getting inform any information the U.S. has to engage because international bodies aren't making any progress. Uh -huh. um, and I guess Iran also detained an EU diplomat from Sweden recently. I, mm. I think it was released, but, like, turns out that, like, the prisoner happened to have been, like, a, a significant Swedish diplomat. So, like... Okay. That's maybe where I would say, like, now's not the time for the U.S. to engage because it's Sweden's fight right now or something. Like, oh, it should be, uh, you know, let's, let's not make the EU try and – or make the U.S. try and play world police over, like, something that's not our issue. Oh, that would man. probably be my, be my best case that I can go for it. Well, anyone who's following the NFALD or the CETA topics this year know that they're talking about nuclear weapons and that information might come in really handy, right? Because the main sticking point between the United States and Iran is their nuclear technology. It doesn't necessarily mean they have, you know, uh, nuclear capable weapons, but mm -hmm. saying that if I'm on the negative and I have to make the case that now is the time I might be focusing on nuclear weapons and how negotiating with Iran might have some influence over Russia, Ukraine, hmm. because we can now we could leverage like any sort of negotiation or agreement that we come up with with Iran because Iran, you know, and Russia have somewhat of a relationship. 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's if it's official, but I know like they they, they get weapons um, that are left by Russian soldiers and they are Iranian produced. You know what I mean? So, um, yeah, they, they, I think there's also still trade there. I think like energy trade between Iran and Russia is still a thing right now. Yeah. And so maybe like if you, you're like, all right, this is an opportunity to kind of like start putting a wedge between Iran and Russia and waiting on like we can't. What are we going to do? We're going to wait for the war to end. Like right now is the time that we want to take advantage of this and hmm. you know, really try to undermine that. So uh, I don't know how sound of a, um, a strategy that is, uh, because I, I don't necessarily just, you know, flow over international relation publications all the time. It's more of a, you know, a general following of the news and things like that. So I'm just kind of basing on that. And hopefully after, uh, you know, 30 minutes, it would kind of sub substantiate that strategy. But um, that would be my approach. I think I might do a, a Russia approach on it. Yeah, I think you could probably get into it. So the, the status quo has all kinds of issues, right? So like when Trump pulled out of um, the nuclear agreement um, with Iran, that was like re like setting the clock back to whatever, like 2012 or something. Uh, and at that time, there were a lot of really in like, there was, there's really good um, evidence saying that like all of the sanctions the U S had against Iran were only hurting the people and doing nothing to impact the nuclear program. So uh. like all of the, the sanctions at this moment in time are really like detrimental to the economy of Iran and like trade and mobility and like, you know, progress, which then is trickling into things like human rights and education and like access to you know, medical services and whatever. And so you can say that like the U.S.'s current actions uh, or our current position is re-entrenching this like, you know, uh, I guess isolation of Iran that only ends up really hurting the people. Like when similar things kind of going on in North Korea, where like they're going to use whatever, you know, finance they have into a nuclear program like that's not going to be hurt by whatever sanctions what is going to be hurt is like trade and like small businesses and like people that are trying right. to get stuff up and going um that, that can't import or export materials so that's that's probably the best case i think or that's one of the cases you can probably run for on the negative is like every minute that we're not re-engaging in negotiations is like more time that just the iranian people are being hurt no so, you know, going in, leaving nuclear weapons entirely aside, like just what does our current state of affairs, you know, right. produce? Right. All right. Hey, well, that leaves us with our topic. Boom. Whew. You know what? Like we, I, we had a debate on this, I think only once before. Um, yeah. And it's been so long. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Let's do this. I, I'm still a thing. Better. Yeah. I'm definitely. So there's been like, I, I, so I've got probably better arguments on the neg. So this was like one of my top uh, for both. Mm -hmm. I've got probably better arguments for it on the neg, but I think uh, I've got perhaps more on the affirmative side. So the first being that there have been referenda. So it's like a vote, um, but it does not have binding outcomes. So there've been three of those just in the last several years that Puerto Rico has voted to become a state and it passed, like had a majority of Puerto Ricans voting for it. And the U.S. just said, no, thanks. Like, we don't care. Like, there's there was nothing enforceable or honored about it. Um, so when it comes to, like, individual determination, I'm sure that you can dig deeper into it and say, like, all these votes are skewed or something like that. But uh, just at face value, there have now been multiple votes for Puerto Rico to become a state from Puerto Rico that they have said, yes, they want to join. Okay. So... The vote on, yeah, I, I, you absolutely have to bring that up on the affirmative. Yep. Like, you, you have to. Um, the thing is that the vote in 2020 was like 52, 53%. Not really an overwhelming majority, right? And so if I was going to answer that, I'd say it's like, there's no reversing statehood, right? <laughs> Secession, like, yeah. Yeah, you know what I mean? It's, you're right, right, right. And we've seen what happens when American states try to secede, right? There is no process for that other than civil war. Um, so like it, like this is permanent, which means that like a 3%, you know, over halfway majority is not, I'm like, okay, I'm not sure if we, we've reached that threshold um, uh, where it's, it, it, it really is 
uh, widely held uh, that mm. way. So I would say that that's still a coin toss. I think that's still within, you know, um, the like, what if it was just a bad day to have the vote? What if, it was, <laughs> like, seriously, what if the turnout wasn't what it was expected or there was like misinformation, like 3% is within the, the margin of error of, mm. of that. So it's a toss up. I wouldn't say that there, you know, it's like, they, like, I would not say that there is a silent majority. That's not the argument I'm making. I'm just saying the vote is inconclusive. We have to look elsewhere. <laughs> so mm. but that's all defense. You know what I mean? It's like, and so it's not the best. I think I would be on the neg, probably talking about, you could easily do a politics DA because now you get those, the you know, basically democratic votes. It just makes democratic presidents much more likely and what sort of stuff that would happen. But I think sure. it might be more of a, a, a cultural thing, right? Because mm -hmm. uh, Puerto Rico is majority Spanish speaking. Right. Uh, I think if you made like statehood, I think there would be a lot of pressure to have, you know, English be the official language of the island. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and like that is just a one uh point of like the identity and cultural uh, politics that would play in making them into state you know yeah 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 so i think yeah, the definitely like the erosion of puerto rican culture um yeah. i think and you can like i the best i've got is like defense against that like well cultures always blend and there's already puerto rican culture in the united states and like things are you know mixing but uh one really good argument that i saw on the negative side was saying that like or i guess there were two it was that it would make it so much easier for uh, America, so for current U.S. citizens to move to Puerto Rico now the new first state, and real estate would just be like decimated. So like oh. locals would have no place to live. Um, hey. So it would just be, like gentrify the island really, really fast. It's right. like, oh look, it's now a state. We can move there and like tax right. haven and whatever. Like you can buy beachfront property because real estate value is not the same. Like, I mean, even just look at what real estate is like in Hawaii and what it's like to live on Hawaii as a local and not as like an expat from, you know, the, the continental 48, but right. to be there like cost of living is ridiculously high. And there's all kinds of, you know, issues that you're constantly facing with just tourists that want to buy because it looks pretty. And that ends up, you know, really wrecking a lot of like local infrastructure, even um, with, you know, you can look to local fires and things It's just like major tragedy. So, and that's with a state that's been a state for a good while. So I think I'd start to look at examples there, but then uh, some of the others were like the kind of economic situation of Puerto Rico would end up being absorbed by the U S. So it ends up like, okay, every issue. So this is where I think on the affirmative side, I'd probably, I would just have to turn this argument and be like, yes, we have an obligation. They're already a territory they're you know, decimated by natural disasters all the time. We have an obligation to protect them where every time it's been like, will the president, won't the president send aid? This is now like, hey, you know, a, this is part of our country. We have to protect it like any part of our country. So I think you just get all the humanitarian stuff of like protect them from the natural disasters that plague them. Yeah, like FEMA funding would be totally different if they were a state. Right, yeah. yes. And there was a lot of expenses they were talking about like, um, you know, even like healthcare and education and human services, as well as like, you know, the probably shoring up, um, you know, military. I don't know what a, the existing military presence is there, but basically take uh, every area in which the continental U.S. currently spends money and then apply that to a, now a new place and a place that probably has more difficult infrastructure. Funny, though, the World Health Organization says that Puerto Rican healthcare is actually better than American healthcare. So that's oh. that'd be a fun little you know, turn. That um, is. But you, in many other areas, I can assume like there are challenges that Puerto Rico faces that the other 50 states don't currently. So that would be there'd be some pretty significant costs on it that I think you can throw on the negative side. And I would just have to say like, yeah, but they deserve it. Um, yeah, it, it, it is tougher to, to sell on the affirmative. Well, I'd be looking out if I'm on the negative. The argument I'm looking out for from the affirmative is representation. I mean, mm -hmm. like they, like the president still has, you know, immense influence over puerto rico the, sure. the you know um the, the states do and like how much funding they get and stuff like that and they just don't get a voice right yeah. they don't get a vote in the electoral college um they you know representation is just lacking in congress they don't right, have like real votes to make real change um and so yeah. like being in territory is almost like being the state of limbo um, yeah so i think that's a, i think that argument needs to be in pretty much everybody's affirmative. I don't see why you'd, why you would not mm -hmm. put it in there. 
Yeah, you know, I'm actually just realizing you can probably just make a great big fat colonialism argument on yeah. the negative side of like, okay, even if there is a group, yeah. yeah, who set up these uh, elections? Like, who was yeah. motivated for them? Where did the money come from for these elections? Like, I, yeah. you can probably start tracing it back to interests in the U.S. for many of those things that it was not really just a you know local wish to become a state from day one. Mm. There's all kinds of nasty colonial roots from the beginning and up until now, and it only would just get worse post plan. Oh, um, man. you know what? Counter plan Puerto Rico should assert its sovereignty. Yo, 100%. Yeah, total independence. Yeah. So there's a lot of, there was like a few good articles I read. The Atlantic had like a pretty big spread on like why complete independence for Puerto Rico is better. Oh, um, wow. And which like bold stance to take, but I think that there's avenue that would be where I would be spending a, a decent bit of my research. Um, on the negative, I think that would make for a much more, you know, lively debate. Oh man, it would be it, the you start moving from the middle to the extremes. You know what I mean? That'd be, wow. We start off as a territory. It's like, all right, like are they in or are they out? Out? You know, like yeah, yeah. So you okay. could also do some kind of like fun consultation counter plan. I mean, it starts to buy into the same rhetoric of like who paid for and who set up the elections, whatever. Right. But yeah. if you wanted to, you could do some kind of like binding consultation counter plan, like pending. The 2024 election, the results are like the, the the ballot will be cast for either statehood or independence, and you know the outcomes oh, wow. of what people vote for. Oh, just a ballot with only those two options. Okay, so on a side note, those are my favorite types of criteria in debate, where it's like, okay, judge, I want you to imagine a world in which Puerto Rico is having an election, and on the ballot there are only these two choices. All mm. right, independence or statehood. You are a Puerto Rican citizen. Which one do you vote for? We're going to make an argument this way. You're going to make an argument that way. When you sign your ballot, you're basically filling out a ballot. You are literally filling out a ballot and uh, with a forced choice between those two. And so what that does is it takes out the... That's fun framing. That's yeah. Cool. You know what I mean? Like that's... I, I wish I could coach more students to, to think about criteria that way and to explain it that way. Because hmm. I just think, I don't know, people like being sort of sucked into role playing. And if it's still really topical and it's really... Uh, productive as a way of visualizing why I'm doing what I'm doing as a judge. I think it's great. I like that a lot. That's cool. That'd be a fun All one. Right. Well, that's a good way to end it. All right. So uh, we are Tim and Jared. Matt isn't with us, but he's still happy to be here. All right. Uh, we're Debate Sensei, uh, and we will be back with another topic uh, next week. All right. See you later, everyone. Have a good one.